Okay, welcome back, and we're rejoining the game where we left off in early November 1852. And uh, let's have an appraisal of the situation. We won't go into too much depth because obviously we kind of left off um, at the same point in time. So as you can recall, uh, the Russians made a play for Plevna, probably looking to kind of get back through up into Bessarabia. Um, and in the second big engagement of Plevna, um, Omar Pasha dealt them um, a defeat. Um, it was two engagements actually spread over a fortnight, the second one being rather significant, resulting in um, uh, 11,000 prisoners coming into our possession. And it, this is the second time now that Omar Pasha's attempted move into Sofia has been disrupted. He's only two days now, so he's obviously just on the frontier. He's two days travel from Sofia. And the plan going into late November is he is going to move into Sofia and uh, engage and destroy any Russian forces that he comes across. We are going to be taking the fight to them, and the plan is to rock their world and um, destroy Russian uh, forces in the Balkans and retake Sofia. Um, in the east, uh, Krasnov, Ka Ka Krasnov's cavalry division is still sitting outside Ezerum. It's a very, very modest sort of force, um, and he's still sort of besieging. Um, the structure, uh, we have a, a fairly significant garrison, it's a much larger force than the besieging force. Um, there's nothing to do there in the short term, I don't think there's any risk of Ezerim falling. Um, there's uh, ample stockpile of supplies and munitions, and we are looking to achieve force concentration in the north of Batumi. Ritsa Pasha is 14 days away, he's going to be joining up with um, Abdi Pasha's command, and we of course have Hussein Avni. Um, who is going to be depositing? We'll actually just make sure that's set to properly disembark, distant unload, and we'll set to disembark. Uh, we'll just, dis yeah, disembark in Batumi. That's good. Um, yeah, uh, the Imperial fleet sorted into the Black Sea, um, but it looks like uh, its departure from Constantinople was delayed, perhaps awaiting uh, some supplies um, before it departed. So it's going to continue its patrol uh, going into the Sea of Azov, back into the central Black Sea, and then wind up um, just. Uh, just uh, just outside um, Odessa. I think we're going to kind of develop that patrol a little bit further. We'll head south, and then we'll head into the Aegean. That's 11 days. And then we'll conduct a, a small patrol in the Aegean. That's 15 days. And then after that, we'll head all the way back up to Constantinople. Um, so that's a bit more of a developed patrol. Now we... Um, yeah, the raiding, uh, the raiding force did sustain some damage. Now let's have a look at our replacements. Now, uh, replacements for... Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Now, these are terribly expensive, <laughs> these things. So, uh, light warships, which is what they are. They're basically all frigates. Um, 35 money, steel, manufactured goods, coal. Okay, we'll invest for one of those. And, uh, in fact, we'll go for two. Why not? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's not kind of too damaging or too upsetting. In terms of our merchants are okay. We don't require any replacements for our merchants for the time being. Okay, that's that's good. So uh, we're ordering two replacement parts, repair parts, which are very expensive items for these ships. Um, we'll set them to uh, passive posture and yeah, evade combat. We need to conduct some repairs to these ships before they head back out and conduct raiding operations in the med. That's pretty much it. The only other thing is we have got an accumulation of private capital, not enough to really build anything, but we've got some manufactured goods and steel um, and a bit of state revenue. So I think what we're going to do, well, we won't need state revenue for this, but I'm going to look to um, continuously try and sort of over a period of time expand the merchant fleet. And we're on a position 612 manufactured goods, 150 days. Let's get um, another merchant uh, fleet prepared or merchant squadron in Constantinople. That'll take a bit of time. And um, I think the next merchants would probably send to, let's have a look, we've got some in the North Sea, probably the Western Maritime Trade Box uh, will be the next um, next place for a merchant fleet. Um, so we kind of, you know, getting our economic tentacles sunk into different markets. And that's something that the Ottomans didn't really do in real life. Um, so that would kind of uh, broaden our, our scope in terms of our import and export market. Now that is pretty much it in terms of moves that we have planned. Uh, we don't have anything else kind of on the cards. I think one thing we might do is use this force as a scouting force and kind of to keep, get a bit of an eye, uh, eye on what's happening in Sarajevo. Um, if they're engaged, they are set to retreat. The British and the French don't really seem to be doing much, do they? Um, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they, I mean, it's, it's welcome to have their troops, of course, guarding Constantinople and Salonika. The fact that there's a French force in Salonika is very opportune because that might well have been a target, but they've not conducted any kind of independent campaign in the Crimea. Uh, maybe that's something they will look to do once we've kind of, uh, once we've finished the business. Um, 
in the Balkans. Um, in terms of weather, you wouldn't think it was early November. We've had a, a particularly kind of clement um, autumn. No heavy rainfall really over any of the kind of Balkan Peninsula from what I can see. So no quagmire, no supply problems. Armies are going to be moving pretty much as though it were summer. Presumably the weather is slightly colder, but um, there's no real kind of suggestion of any snowfall, even in the mountains yet. This might have ramifications, you know, if this is a particularly kind of dry autumn or, um, you know, pleasant start um, to uh, the kind of autumn and winter months, perhaps that might mean that the, you know, the, these, the sort of poor weather once it starts may linger slightly further on into the spring. Maybe not, um, but we'll see. But certainly we're, we're going to be approaching very soon, I would have thought, um, a, a sort of period of bad weather. And that will change things in the Balkans. You know, of course, that makes, it makes, I mean, we're in a pre-railroad environment still very much in the, in the Balkans and in the Ottoman Empire more generally. So supplies require tracks and roads, and if they, they become quagmire, uh, then that makes supplies and logistics more difficult, armies move slower, and so on. Um, so that will uh, mix things up a little bit. But so far, so good. No bad weather to speak of. That's all of our moves made. Um, I've, I've kind of already organized the economic administration. Uh, the economy is uh, fairly stable, no major upsets. Um, domestic consumption ever so slightly depressed. Um, but nothing to be too concerned about. Trade balance is poor, as it's expected to be, because we're, again, hoarding as many manufactured goods as we can get. When the opportunity presents itself, once we have the right kind of technological capacity, we're going to be looking to maybe uh, begin to allow a railroad in Constantinople, uh, maybe linking it up to Adrianople, something like that. But uh, that may be some years off yet. Uh, I, don't, I, I can't imagine it would be. We're in 52. I think by 53, 54, uh, we should have the capacity to do that. But we'll see. Um... But economic administration is set. I think for the most part, um, everything we want held back on the domestic market is held back. So I think we're good to go. And uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Omar Pasha, all eyes on you. Let's pass turn and um, yeah, head into late November. See how it goes. <coughs> it's incredible to think that next year will be what? 53... 1853, which will have been 400 years since the Ottomans took Constantinople. <laughs> Incredible that has a 400 year, uh, yeah, 400 years they've controlled the city. Absolutely astonishing period of time, really. And of course, the Ottoman Ghazi state existed for you know um, a good century or two uh, prior to, to taking Constantinople. It's a bit of a kind of a bit, bit of a myth, I think, in the kind of um, Western imagination that the Ottomans were kind of rather bequeathed this colossal city, you know, um, which they took, and that this kind of um, provided them really with the capacity to be kind of like centre of the world stage and this sort of thing. It's not really true. I mean, Constantinople. By the time the Ottomans took Constantinople, in I think it was May, May fourteen fifty three. Um, I mean, the city was completely dilapidated, largely depopulated. And this wasn't um, a feature of the siege or a byproduct of the siege, which was very short. I mean, Constantinople had been in decline, I mean, since the uh, 11th century, arguably, and a decline which was accelerated by the kind of the famous sacking of the Crusades, of course, of the city. Um, but long before the Ottomans even considered um, besieging Constantinople, it had a population of something like 25 to sort of 40,000, you know, from a high water mark of probably 800,000, maybe even a million, uh, during its kind of peak. And um, it would have been a strange experience, I think, for the Ottomans, because on the one hand, they would have, they would be entering into a city with colossal structures, a metropolis, the likes of which they would have never seen, with the largest structures, I think. I think at that time, still the largest structures built by humans, if you consider things like the Hagia Sophia. And yet it was completely dilapidated, overgrown, um, largely depopulated, you know, and had fallen into a considerable state of disrepair. So the suggestion is that, I think it was Mehmed II, who was the, the Ottoman monarch at the time, quite young, was very melancholy as he kind of entered the city. And the city was sacked, although sackings at this time um, in the 15th century was just a feature of warfare. And it wasn't an arbitrary thing. Soldiers were paid. Or a large part of the army would be paid on the basis of what, you know, if they survived, didn't die from disease, didn't die from the suicidal attacks <laughs> that the kind of generals or uh, monarchs pressed them into, in the event that they took a city, the only form of payment they had is that they would be they would be given a few days where they could sort of take anything that they wanted, you know, um, loot, rape, pillage. And that is exactly what they did in Constantinople. But the buildings were preserved. And this was a very conscious act. The... Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of kind of accounts. A lot of them are kind of 
cheesy kind of eye rolling sort of uh you know hagiography hey, on the part of court historians and this kind of thing but there's a couple of histories that are fairly well regarded that sort of suggests that um the monarch was deeply moved upon entering the city and what his his empire had kind of inherited you know and the, the yeah was in a deep state of melancholy and the state of disrepair of the city and there's one particular story which is thought if not to be true at least based in some kind of truth where Mehmed rode up to the, the Hagia Sophia and there was an Ottoman soldier chiseling at the kind of marble on the floor, trying to get some marble, you know, sort of uh, with, his, with his blade. And the, the monarch, kind of Mehmed, said, you know, what are you doing? Asked what he was doing. And the soldier um, said, I'm doing this for the faith, you know. Um, Mehmed was, was said to have drawn his sword and, and run the soldier through and um, exclaimed to the troops that, you know, the booty, the loot is yours, the buildings are mine, sort of thing and uh quoted the uh, anonymous persian poet i can't really remember the verse it was something along the lines of the spiders weave the weave the curtains in the palace of the caesars and uh the owls call the sentries or the watchmen in the towers of afraziab and i think it's a multifaceted verse but i think um in this case in part refers to i suppose i suppose nature reclaiming things you know uh, which is what the city would have looked like at the time. I mean, many of the buildings, even in the mid, you know, mid 15th century, would have been empty for hundreds of years, um, not used. Many of the old Roman structures had long fallen into disrepair, long before the Ottomans besieged the city, you know. And um, the Ottomans, it, it, I mean, they, they, they really, the uh, Constantinople that the Ottomans had was a city that they made. It wasn't an inheritance. I mean, they organized a massive public works program to basically bring the city back to life. Even most of the Greeks that wound up living in Constantinople, and Constantinople during the Ottoman period was far more cosmopolitan than sort of the Istanbul of today, insofar as it was a um, very, very mixed ethnic kind of uh, city. I mean, today it's much more kind of um, Turkish, it's much more ethnically homogenous. But um, yeah, I mean, most of the Greeks that even ended up living in Constantinople were bought there by the Ottomans. You know, if you consider that it had a population of at most 40,000, and the Ottomans probably killed. 10 to 20 during the sacking of the city killed or enslaved nearly half the population which was very small uh, the population that was brought in was brought in within a period of a thing they think a decade to two decades the ottomans brought the population back up to something like 500,000, which is incredible to think he goes and it is a turkish victory outstanding omar pasha doing his thing which is winning battles very very Small engagement, though, actually. Um, only 5,000 casualties inflicted and two rounds of combat. And it looks like only one army corps, like an army corps and a cavalry division. Let's see if that develops. And that's on day three. Let's see if that develops into anything else. That's good news. That's very good news. Uh, the hope is, okay, 800 prisoners as well. The hope is that the Yemenis back off and give us... What I really like, actually, one thing I really enjoy about these Yemeni um, is that the cavalry... These soldiers actually pretty much look like what ottoman soldiers would have looked like prior to the nazi Nazi did they kind of you know they would have looked i mean especially the cavalry uh sort of the cavalry kind of um, art love that yeah they look very similar to what ottoman soldiers would have looked like in the uh the kind of the classical period of the ottoman empire <clears throat> yeah it looks like they've fallen back as well so that will give us a little bit of a kind of window a bit of breathing room and what is this zvornik okay are you joking? It actually destroyed that, um, yeah, that, 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 uh, so that was the kind of, um, cavalry brigade completely wiped out. We could rebuild that. They're very small and kind of cheap, but I, yeah, that must have been surprised, I think. Um, yeah, it, it obviously didn't see, and hence it was kind of ambushed and completely wiped out, but that force was set to disengage. Looks like most of them are, in, in fact, they, uh, they're virtually all prisoners. Okay. Ah. Nikolai Moriyev Kars, also a fairly aggressive strategist, not very good defensive. But he's in Zvornik, which is not far from Sofia. Okay. Are oh, you joking me? We've switched places. <laughs> a big battle in Niche, which looks like it was between the French and the Russians. Are you going to be joking? Is that another Russian force landing in Constantinople? Irritating git. <laughs> I mean, it's something that we can readily deal with, but it's, um, yeah. Oh, we've taken Sophia back by the looks of it as well. But yeah, it looks like we somehow kind of switched places. This is what I mean by kind of armies and provinces being a little porous at this time. You know, it is possible for armies to kind of switch places, but um, it means we're going to have to then go back up. Oh, but there's still a British force in Constanta. 
I mean, if they pull their finger out, stay there, and set, you know, set to maybe even an offensive posture so that they engage anything that falls back, we could still feasibly trap most Russian forces in the Balkans. But, I mean, we've got, we've got Sofia back. That's good enough for me. And it looks like the French are actually defeated in Niche, which is just, um, just west of Sofia. They've fallen back into Sofia. <clears throat> Okay, let's have a look. Changes from objectives. Up. Okay, <clears throat> plus three. That's good news. And yeah, that must be from uh, restoring. Restoring Sophia to our control. Okay, good news. Well, there's a French army that definitely wants to be uh, be involved in, in the in the game now. We held Plevna long enough to get a garrison in place. Twenty-eight thousand. That force is completely out of supplies now. <laughs> and I'm going to take it to march back. Four days. This force in niche looks like. I don't know who won really. Uh, that's an irritating thing that we don't know who won between the. Uh, so look, succeeded in retreating from battle in Bulgaria. Oh, they've made a breach in this fortress. That's interesting. Well, convincing defeat of uh, the Russians anyway in Sofia. Sofia is well and truly back in our hands, uh, but the Russians, it looks like. Largely managed to, managed to slip past. I think really now it's going to be a case of marching back and then maybe even heading right up to kind of Constanta. My thinking is they're going to fall back up into Constanta. And um, yeah, doing the same. All out attack, engaging them. And kind of doing everything that we can really <laughs> to sort of destroy that Russian force. I mean, they have no supplies now. Um, but that is the lion's share of the Russian force that's kind of in the kind of chaotic engagement on the frontier that they kind of slip past and we've sort of switched positions now which is uh you know but we wanted sophia back and we want them out of the balkans and last analysis and that's the priority make sure these uh bashi bazooks are set to kind of fall back if they're engaged yeah they are well there's a french force here anyway that will hopefully keep these russians in check and this french force is more substantial than the russian force at niche which makes me think that the russians may have lost um yeah i think that's going to be the response in the west anyway um let's make sure we keep the in imperial fleet in um the bosporus just for the time being just to stop uh for, I, I fleetingly thought that maybe the russians uh, in fact let's just move north that the russians might be trying to land a force in constantinople All right let's inspect the east then Well, we now have a proper army command. We have a force of the southern look, 80, 89,000 men, 10,000 horses, 300 cannons. Let's get our command structured. And how long would it take Rita Pasha? 50 days. You've got to be kidding me. <clears throat> But they've made some breaches in the structure, so it looks like um, and this cavalry division does have a line brigade, so they probably have maybe some light guns or something, but um, I can't see them taking it, even with a fortress completely destroyed. Um, our, I mean, our garrison force is only 30,000 men, but then at the same time, at the same time, they are mostly irregulars. Uh, you know they're not uh, they're not sort of frontline combat troops, whereas these are. So there's nothing we can really do about it though. I mean, Rita Pash is not activated. It's going to take him at this stage 50 days, which is ludicrous. Uh, okay, I can see why. So yeah, uh, we're getting rain now in the east. So you can see straight away the ramifications of bad weather. Um, yeah, 
rains again okay, we're getting some snow in the mountains so yeah the weather's changing now we're in late november we're even getting some snow in the kind of plains of central anatolia um let's have a look at weather and weather and the rest is still okay some snow snow and sleet But not enough to affect Omar Pasha. Omar Pasha's strategic value is sufficient that he can move quite well even in quite poor weather. But um, that may change as the quality of the ground kind of deteriorates. Okay, let's flick through our reports really quickly then. Uh, so Parliament of Germany retracted drainage, inflicted five hits on the siege of Sana. Okay, structure's intact. Okay, we'll set these guys to a defensive posture. And let's look at what structures we can build. We need an anchorage. Coaling station, 43 money, 21, 21 manufactured goods. It's expensive and we can't lose it, that's the thing. It's, it is, you know, it's not colossally expensive in terms of money, but 21 manufactured goods is absolutely daft. I think at the very least, so five money or fifty money, rather fifty uh, state revenue, five manufactured goods. Let's get a military outpost there. Um, a mission. Now we'll just do that in in the short term, I think. Um, but we kind of need supplies there, don't we? <laughs> I wonder if it makes sense to build an anchorage a little bit further north. Okay, I think at the very least. We'll move uh, one of these supply trains north. 12 days. And then hopefully sitting there, it can restock with supplies, and we can start getting a shuttle system going up and down the Red Sea. Um, yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, we'll sit tight, trying to reorganise um, as best we can. We've got set to a defensive posture, and that's all we can do there for now. It's a little bit expensive, I think, to kind of release that amount of manufactured goods for something that is somewhat peripheral. Um, Okay, let's get this um, transport squadron back to Synop. And let's quickly check on uh, the forces that are being built in Constantinople. So we've got a river squadron, uh, transport squadron, and merchant ships. Okay. Yeah, so those spare parts were instantly used by the looks of it, and we'll see. It may take a little bit of time before we actually see kind of uh, no, we can actually see results almost straight away. <clears throat> we'll go another one, and we'll go another two. Okay, combat moves set to the west. Then it's to move up into Plevna. And then um, follow up, moving into Constanta, um, anticipating that they're going to fall back into Constanta. I think they're more likely to do that than Varna, but if they fall back into Varna, that's tr that's fine. We'll sit in Constanta and then head south. That is a long march, and it is in difficult weather, which means that when that march is complete, Omar Pasha's force will require rest. It will require a fortnight at least, I think, to reorganize its forces and this sort of thing. Um, but... Sophia's um, back in our hands. I mean, the other option, I suppose, is Omar Pasha's here. We could move... Um, yeah, I mean, we could move west, Zvornik, Sarajevo. It's going to take 20 days, and we've now got snowfall in uh, in Zvornik and Sarajevo and Nish. So, again, the force will be somewhat disorganized. Um, this is the main Russian force, though, so I'm thinking we move. We move on that. It sounds like a silly, kind of strange thing, but the Russian force falling back into Varna may not be the worst thing for us. 
Um, yeah, I think this is the best move. This is the move. I'm going to go with my gut, I think, on that. Imperial fleet is set. Okay, let's have a quick look at reports then. So, Patrick's what's you saying happening? Mm. So the garrison has rallied. Okay. Well, taking Bulgaria, managed to capture six crates of ammunition. So the capture of uh, Sofia has done much to bolster support for the war. Yeah, let's have a quick look at Russian um, national morale. 54 or 94 rather. Okay, not uh, not great, not terrible. Well, Sofia, that yeah, gets fine. We know about that. Okay, so one force has suffered damage from bad weather. That's it. You know, ironically, not, nothing to do with rain or snow, probably extreme heat in the interior. Um, okay, let's set this force to attack. Uh, we'll organize a sustained attack. And yeah, I mean, we're sort of a little low on supplies. Uh, I think if we do it now, and then maybe. Yeah, we'll pull back as well. So I'll engage that force and then automatically pull back into Benghazi and find with that. And my Pasha congratulated. New seniority one. Uh, he's now the most senior officer. I mean, he's uh, you can't get any more senior than that. And he's held in extremely high regard. Salim Pasha is the new lieutenant general, which uh, who took command of the independent cavalry division. He it looks like he did well there. Uh, that, I think that was his um, that was his first engagement because in the second Plevna he was actually joining that force. I think so. That's his first action, and it looks like he proved himself well. It's good to know. Let's check our economic administration. I think that's all good. That's everything that we want to export. Um, commodities that we basically have too much of. We do generate a bit of timber, but I want to keep that uh, back, I think, for the time being. Um, it's one of our exports. Uh, tobacco, textiles, excellent. Dyes, fruits, fish, cereals. Yeah, Britain, you can really see the effect now of the kind of uh, deal we have with Britain. Britain is our main trading partner. Uh, that's good news. Uh, 37 units exported for 126, 61 uh, units of goods in the domestic market for 238. That's probably one of the lowest figures this year. It's uh, not a great fortnight economically. Uh, imports sitting at 12, and our imports were supply and manufacturing goods. Okay, let's just very quickly check. We collected some tax revenue this uh, quarter as well. Uh, let's quickly switch over to Chesapeake. Again, we're going to still offer a premium. And inflation is still sitting at 2%. Average satisfaction up to uh, 80, that's good. And um, yeah, stockpile 4844. Yeah, that's all good. Good indices in the economy. Um, it's ticking over minimal disruption actually in the greater scheme of things considering that you know we've got Russian armies kind of marching through the Balkan Peninsula although the uh, the Ottoman economy is very heavily centered around Constantinople you know um, so in a strange sort of way um, I mean if the entire empire was reduced to Constantinople probably it would be really problematic but uh, it's it's the only major city that we have really it's a sort of huge metropolis so this Smyrna is actually pretty Pretty kind of that's the second city of the empire for sure. <clears throat> that's good, excellent. Okay, everything looks pretty decent there. Uh, nothing to worry about, no serious concerns. Let's check Academy of Sciences really quick. Um, that's taking longer than I thought that percussion cup muskets would start speeding up a bit. I'm tempted to start sort of uh, investing um, state revenue into this, but um, 
it's not going to make a difference in this war anyway i don't think i mean it's going to be you know that's a good couple of years away it's a few years off um so uh, i don't really feel like the economy is quite large enough we don't collect enough tax revenue from transactions yet to actually be able to sustain that um and i think it's only it's only really worth doing that once you can sustain it uh, once you can keep it up and you can just basically have that continuously invested in in the background to accelerate research it's a very inefficient way of increasing research and research in any case has a bit of a moment, sort of momentum of its own all right uh, let's pass turn why not let's do two turns um, given that it's a Sunday although I suppose this will be aired on, on Monday I'll have this set to go on Monday but um, in any case let's pass turn that's everything economic administration set um, I'm a bit OCD and always looking to think that maybe I've missed something, but no, I haven't. Uh, let's very quickly check our foreign ministry. Nothing to reply to. Relations solid with Britain and France. That's good. Prussia. Uh, yeah, no, no significant developments there. Okay, let's pass turn. Yeah, so I was rambling about. Um, what was I rambling about? Constantinople. Yeah, the Ottomans. Uh, once they captured it, it was a kind of uh, a colossal metropolis, but virtually empty. And um, yeah, they, they um, organized a massive public public works program, I and mean, the likes of which wouldn't have existed at the time. You probably wouldn't have seen anything on this scale um, until like the, you know the, the mid 20th century, until the 1930s, probably in the Soviet Union, Magneto Gorsk, that sort of thing. Um, but it's I mean some sources suggest that within 10 to 20 years, they had the population back up to half a million, and by the kind of high water mark during the kind of height of the classical Ottoman period, which is supposed to kind of um, you know, 15th, 16th centuries, um, you know, they got the, the population back up to 800,000, some say as high as a million, um, but it was returned, restored as a great metropolis. And most of the kind of old Byzantine structures, the old Roman um, aqueduct, the sort of uh, the, the sewage system, these things were repaired um, by the Ottomans. One interesting thing as well is the, the Byzantines left this kind of legacy of bathhouses, which they hadn't, u hadn't used. Bathhouses fell out of fashion in the Byzantine Empire, beginning really with the 9th century, because of... Uh, you know, the adoption of Christianity, increasingly the church viewed the kind of bathhouse culture as being, I suppose, associated with the kind of um, the polytheism, the kind of decadence and polytheism of the kind of uh, the old Greco-Roman world. So bathhouses had fallen out of fashion in the Byzantine Empire centuries before the collapse of the Byzantines. And yet, many of the buildings that existed, you know, uh, many of the bathhouses were still there. And the Ottomans um, didn't have the same kind of foible around bathhouses that the kind of Byzantines had. And yeah, they restored the kind of bathhouse culture of. Um, I mean, you still have this today, don't you? The kind of the idea of Turkish baths and this sort of thing. But yeah, they they restored the bathhouse culture, and in a strange way, the Ottomans were sort of more similar, I suppose, to the kind of. Um, I suppose the kind of Greco-Roman world that we associate with antiquity than the Byza than the Byzantines had become. The Byzantines uh, had become something very alien, very different from the kind of. Um, I suppose the kind of classical Rome of antiquity, uh, the kind of which we tend to see in sword and sandals films and that sort of thing but yeah i mean you have the system of dev shermy classical slavery you know this sort of thing um but yeah the city was restored in its entirety i mean uh and i don't know how i mean they, they i think it was a combination of drafting people and forcing them uh, sort of knife point really to go to constantinople bringing slaves to constantinople but also providing kind of financial incentives you know um, but it worked it came off and restored the city um, entirely, and of, of, of course, uh, added to a lot of structures as well. They built palaces and mosques and this sort of thing. Um, so even most of the Greeks that lived in Constantinople by the 19th century would have been bought there by the Ottomans, you know, funnily enough. But yeah, it was much more kind of ethnically diverse, which reflects much, I suppose, about the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't, um, it was, uh, I mean, even in the early Ghazi state, when the Ottomans were centered around here in Bursa, in the West, they the, the the Ottomans, the Turks themselves, were an ethnic minority there. That mo most of the people that lived there were Greek, you know. So even in their sort of infancy, the Ottomans sort of, um, I suppose, could have inhabited a very kind of multi-ethnic sort of world. And um, it was only really, I suppose, with the birth of the Turkish Republic that ethnicity and nationality became much more kind of associated. Um, but yeah, interestingly, the Ottomans even adopted the old classical custom of like donatives which was something that destroyed the roman army <laughs> it made it unaffordable but it was the kind of culture of, uh, uh, with the ascendancy of a new monarch the monarch would give out a kind of donative to the army you know and uh, which would be a kind of a sum of money and initially this was very modest when you go back to kind of um 
the Roman Empire, when you go back to the days of Octavian and the early Empire, this would be maybe it would be like a few months' wage. Uh, but throughout the period of Roman history, um, you know, especially during political crises, these donatives became exorbitant, and especially during the crisis of the third century, where you have like three or four monarchs reigning simultaneously or vying for power they're kind of auctioning you know they're, <laughs> they're, they're kind of auctioning the army the army's loyalty and donatives became colossal to the point that by late roman sort of history and by the time of the byzantine empire the traditional kind of legionary professional army had become completely unaffordable you know and this was something that the ottomans imitated a little bit and uh this was something that i suppose with all of the other things that i've kind of mentioned tied into the kind of decay of the Janissaries, precisely when they became less effective as a military force, they became unbelievably expensive. And they became larger, it just became a large, kind of colossal sort of bureaucracy, you know, um, that was, yeah, unaffordable. There it goes, oh, this looks like... No way, the Russians actually um, attempted to storm Plevna. Interesting. And it looks like it kind of came off. Uh, okay. Or not completely. We'll see. Yeah, they're obviously desperate for supplies. That's good. That is really good news. Yeah, excellent job. That's good to know. This was becoming a running sore. Hopefully, they will fall back into Egypt and bother them. Yeah, so that is Plevna now very much in the hands. And what day are we on? Day four in the hands of the Russians, but of course, as we know, and I'm not sure if they, the Russians know yet, Omar is about to slam into their force. Russian forces passing from the streets of Whoa. That was a big battle. <laughs> that was a serious, that was kind of Waterloo level scale battle. Casualties fairly tight, um, but we also get 174, is that 17,400 prisoners? Many, many regiments completely destroyed. Yeah, that's uh, hard, hard in the win column. Um, I think that's the single biggest uh, victory that we've actually had against the Russians in this war so far. The Third Battle of Plevna. My god, that's definitely something there. That's, you know, street names and ships will be named after that. Three rounds of combat, too. The Russians didn't fancy leaving. Yeah, that was um, that was big boy stuff for sure. Thirty thousand casualties, ten thousand horses. Yeah, I mean casualties are about on par, but um, there's a partial collapse of the Russian force in, in form, the form of prisoners. Um, eight light Cossack regiments completely destroyed. Uh, four militia regiments destroyed. An initial three light cavalry. I mean, yeah, great stuff. Good job, Paskovich, doing his thing, losing hard to us. That, that said, I mean, we're only on day four. Oh wow. Okay, looks like we in, uh, we intercepted um, a transport squadron, garrison forces, no less, moving in the Aegean. Um, Ten thousand men sent to Davy, Davy Jones's locker. Good round, this. Very good round. Looks like they've fallen into Varna as well, which is sort of what we wanted to happen. <laughs> uh, but it looks like Omar's passed through. I mean, it may change that what seems to happen on day 15 is it suddenly kind of switches. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of data is loaded up and all of a sudden the map changes and switches to kind of, you know, so you can sometimes look at it now and think, oh, what's happening? And then all of a sudden, it, it, you know, uh, the turn starts and, um, yeah, everything kind of changes. But uh, let's have a look. It looks like Omar may have just pushed right through Plevna and it looks like a portion of the Russian force might have fallen into the garrison, but uh, that's okay. Um, where the hell is that French force that was in Sofia? I wish they were just do one thing and commit to it. I don't really know what the kind of thinking is behind the Allied strategy, but it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's welcome to have their troops here. It's better to have them here than not. Um, and of course, their mere presence, you know. I mean, just the British and French involvement in the war is important in keeping Russian forces to the north and this kind of thing. If we were fighting Russia alone, we could still win. Uh, definitely, we could still win. Um, but 
But we might be sort of uh, confronting more Russian forces, yeah. So they're still in play for now. Uh, that's a that's a good you know a good round that though. Let's have a quick look through the reports. You many pirates. Let's check that supply force. It'll take a little bit of time for this force to kind of load up the supplies. We'll just pop them in a town. Okay, let's read through the combat reports. Russian besiege in Plevin, I think it's not. Uh... Yeah, two national morale points from that. Um... From that, that's definitely considered a significant battle. Outstanding. A part of me wonders whether it's worth. I mean, that the force is quite badly disorganized, though. But if the Russians have been that badly defeated, I mean, presumably they've been the same sort of boat, no? Five days. The problem is, is that we have to march for five days before engaging them, which even though they kind of, you know, and they just sit tight, so they get five days of reorganizing themselves if their intention is even to stay there. So I think, sadly, this time around, it's going to have to be the case that we sit tight. And, um, yeah, kind of regather our strength. Good round. Let's have a quick flick through here. Yeah, let's have a look in the east, see what's happening in the east. Rita Pasha is not activated. Unbelievable. What an absolute shocker. 41 days. You've got to be kidding me. Christ alive. I wonder if it's worth breaking off one of the core. He's not activated either. What about Abdi? Abdi Pasha is activated. How long will it take him? 22 days. That's a long old time, isn't it? Yeah, it's just difficult weather, mountainous terrain. Okay, let's um, let's send Abdi um, Abdi Pasha south. I mean, he's got an army corps that should be sufficient to kind of. Uh, to deal with that Russian force, but yeah, we want to obviously stop the kind of siege going on forever. Um, looks like they have a cavalry brigade there as well, but that's okay, they're well placed to meet that. Yeah, things are stabilizing a bit in the east actually. Uh, we just need to deal with that. It's a shame it's going to take him 25 days, so he's going to be rather disorganized. Um, I think we'll commit to that, that's fine. Let's have a quick sort of um, a quick kind of scour through the uh, Plevin. Okay, so that's just the cereals farm and everything there. That's good. Abu Karina Pasha, Nadir Pasha, congratulated. Uh, new seniority 12, Ahmed Pasha. Yeah, I mean, congratulations all around. And it looks like we have two officers that are now promotable Zarif Mustafa and Kurshid Pasha. Interesting. No, I mean, these, uh, these guys have all done well, yeah. Both promotable. Excellent. Yeah, well, I think we, we use an opportunity to pause in Constanza, reorganize the force as best we can and get those officers promoted. Um, economically, let's have a quick look. 63 units at 229. Oh. No imports at all, almost that term. Um, yeah, so it's competition is getting tight for manufactured goods. Exports 38 units, 124. Proposed state visit initiated by Russia has been agreed upon by Austria. Yeah, we see you, Russia. We see you. Okay, nothing too alarming, nothing too upsetting there. Let's very quickly check um, Russia's kind of diplomatic arrangements. Austria. Um, no transit rights, that's the main thing. I think that's kind of their game a little bit, to see if they can kind of secure some transit rights. Maybe with Austria. Um, There's nothing we can do anyway. I think they're going to move on Sofia possibly again, um, but there is just nothing we can do. Okay, so I think what we're going to do then is um, I'm going to sort of spend a little bit of time to uh, have a little bit of a look into these reports in, in a bit of detail. 
um, see what more information I can glean and give a little bit of thought to sort of structuring the next move. Um, good though, I mean, you know, a good kind of month. We've, you know, we've kind of recovered from the the kind of upset really of the late summer. We've got Sophia back. I'm not sure how long for. I mean, that core was able to storm Sarajevo because it wasn't a fortress. Um, this army managed to storm Plevna because it's an army of, you know, uh, it's a significant force. This is just an army corps. I cannot see them uh, storming uh, Sofia, but, you know, I may be wrong, but I just can't see them. I can't see that coming off. Um, this is too small a force to do that. And in any case, if we start marching Omar Pasha's force all the way to Sofia, it's going to be completely exhausted by the time it gets there. You know, really, really shattered. And yeah, it could easily be destroyed by a force much smaller than it. So we have to, you know, we've been really aggressive. It's paid off, but we have to temper that a little bit now. We have to sit tight. We have to get replacements and reorganize his force a bit. Yeah, but um, I'll leave it there. Um, next um, next video uh, will be, um, yeah, I'll upload in early December where we are now. And uh, we'll look at some kind of, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look into what moves um, we're going to make. And... Um, yeah, and then conduct that turn. Um, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.